Hey, good morning, Neighborhood Church. Thanks for joining us today for Church at Home. As always, you can stay connected with everything going on at Neighborhood Church in three ways. One, head to ncvisalia.com. Two, follow us on social media. And three, take Neighborhood on the go by downloading the NC app on your phone or device. Neighborhood Church, Easter is right around the corner. It's going to be here before we know it. I have to say, it was so encouraging to see how many people grab Easter baskets after service last Sunday. I was particularly encouraged at how many kids and students decided to also grab baskets as well. One of my students texted me a few hours after service asking questions about how to best fill the basket. I love that our church, our kids and students are for Visalia. If you would like to join us, pick up a basket from Target or another store and drop it off at the church office by March 28th. Hey, this morning, we want to ask you a question, one that we've been asking for a couple weeks now. What's next? What's the next step in your relationship with Jesus? What's the next step here at Neighborhood Church? What's the next way that you can be for Visalia? And we're ready to help you answer that question with a series of first steps, next steps, and further steps that you can take with us at Neighborhood. Head to ncvisalia.com and click what's next to find out more. And as we do every week, we want to say thank you to everyone who continues to give to the mission of Neighborhood Church. Your generosity has been amazing. Everything we do is thanks to those who invest financially in our mission. If you're interested in giving online this morning, head to ncvisalia.com give or text ncvisalia to 77977. Thank you so much. Now let's jump into week two of our current series, Nuts and Bolts. Well, good morning, neighborhood. So glad you could tune in. Uh, we're in the middle of our teaching series, Nuts and Bolts. And what we're doing is, is we're asking questions like, what are the nuts and bolts of Christianity? What's essential to Christianity? And what does it mean to be a Christian? And, and we started the series by talking about Jesus. And, and we said, Christianity begins and ends with a person. It begins and ends with Jesus. And everything else we're talking about when we talk about Christianity is just an expression of Jesus. Jesus is always our lead story because Jesus is unrivaled in history and in eternity. Jesus is the center of Christianity. And I would add, Christians go further than just saying he's the center of Christianity. We would say that Jesus is the center of all reality. And then last week we brought up the Bible and ultimately we said, yes, the Bible is of course essential to the Christian faith, but let's not forget that it's all about Jesus, that the Bible is this incredible library of documents that are both divine and human that are telling a unified story leading us to Jesus, right? Jesus is the center of the Bible. Jesus is the internal logic of the Bible. Jesus is the goal of the Bible. And this morning, I'd like us to continue the conversation, and I want us to talk about baptism. Now, you may not be aware of this, but baptism has actually been a pretty hot-button issue in the history of the Christian church. And the reason being is that, well, there's just lots of different ways that people baptize, and there's lots of different understandings of what exactly baptism means. L let me give you some examples. Um, some people, like, they'll just sprinkle water over you, while others say, no, it's not about sprinkling, it's about fully dunking people into the water. And th in fact, that's what we do here at Neighborhood. We're, we're dunkers, right? And, and then there's some group of Christians who will baptize infants, while others hold to what's called a believer's baptism, meaning they only baptize people who are old enough to say, hey, I personally believe in Jesus, and I want to identify with his way of life and his community of people. In fact, and you may not know this, one of the saddest moments in church history came over a debate between infant and believer baptism. See, if we could go back 500 years in the 16th century, there was a group of Christians who started questioning infant baptism. And they, were, they said, listen, we don't think we should baptize infants, that we should only baptize those that are old enough to say, hey, I personally believe in Jesus, right? And, and at the time, this was a really, really big deal because the church pretty much exclusively baptized infants. 
Well, the group of infant baptizers became furious over this group that didn't want to baptize infants anymore. And so what they did is they went out and they partnered with the state so they could go and arrest these, what they called re-baptizers, and then sentence them to death. Yeah, and, and the way they were executed, in, in the name of Jesus no less, was by what their executioners called their third baptism, right? And it was their third baptism because they'd already been baptized as infants. Then they got baptized again or rebaptized as adults, right? A believer's baptism. And so the executioners said, well, why not a third baptism? And they would tie their hands together, tuck them behind their knees, and then place a pole between their legs to ensure they couldn't escape. And then they'd throw them into a river to drown. All because they were against infant baptism and affirmed a believer's baptism. Capital punishment for believer's baptism is a disgrace. It's a black mark on the church of Jesus. But it is part of our history, no less, and we shouldn't ignore it. So with that story in mind, you may be wondering, um, then why did churches baptize people in the first place? Well, right? Why not just avoid the conversation and not do it? Why, why is this baptism thing such a big deal that 500 years ago it led to the execution of some people, right? Well, it actually goes back 2,000 years to something that Jesus said. It's actually one of the last things he says that gets recorded, which should tell us it's probably pretty important. People usually save the most important words for the end. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus said this when he was talking to some of his very first followers. He said, therefore, go and make disciples. Disciples is a, a learner, a student, a uh, an, an apprentice, right? So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Here's our word. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've ever been part of a baptism event and you've heard that little formula in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you might have thought, well, that we just threw that in because it was kind of a cool church thing, right? But no, it's not our formula. Jesus said, this is my formula. And wherever churches are planted and wherever people embrace Jesus as a part of their spiritual journey, part of the process, I want people to be baptized. And specifically, Jesus said, I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is why, if you're a follower of Jesus, I personally want you to be baptized. Because I've been told by Jesus that as we introduce people to him and as we help people grow, that we're supposed to get you baptized. But even more than all of that, Jesus thought so highly of baptism, he was baptized as well to serve as a model for you and I. Now, let me just give you some quick context that leads us up to Jesus' baptism. I want to go back actually a few hundred years before Jesus comes on the scene and he asks his cousin John to baptize him. See, a few hundred years before Jesus got baptized, the, the Jews had developed a system to bring converts into their faith. And if you were a man, you'd have to first be circumcised. Then there would be what they called a covenant or promise meal that would reflect the most central story of the Jewish faith known as Passover. And then you would have to acknowledge the Jewish religious law. Basically, you'd have to surrender yourself to the law of Moses and in some cases even memorize all or part of it. You'd have to, you'd have to go make a sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. And then finally, you would have to take part in a ceremonial washing. Now, this ceremonial washing was something you did alone. No one washed you, but it represented something, right? It said, I'm cleansing myself of all my Gentileness. That's just my non-Jewishness. I'm cleansing myself. I'm cleansing myself of my sin. I'm cleansing myself of my old way of life. And as I become new, I'm identifying with Judaism and the God of the Jews. Now, again, it's important to know no one did this for you or to you. You did this by yourself. But then, in and around the year 30, a guy named John, this is Jesus' cousin, showed up by the Jordan River. And he started preaching, um, and his message was very simple. Repent, repent, repent. And it's like, John, we got it. Anything else? Nope. Repent. That's it. Right? Here's how a, a man named Matthew introduces us to John and his story. Here's, here's what we read. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
And people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. See, here's what's happening. John said to the Jewish people, God is about to do something unique in our midst. God is about to do something brand new. God is about to do something that's never been done before. And if you're not right with God, you're going to miss it. If you're not right with God, when God does it, you're not going to see it, right? And then John did the strangest thing. He went down into the Jordan River and he said, if you're ready to repent, I want you to come down in the water with me. And people would line up to enter the water with John. And then John did something that really hadn't been done before. And we don't know exactly how he'd do it, but whatever he did, it looked like some kind of ceremonial washing. Again, this had never been done before because remember, ceremonial washing was always done by yourself. But now John's helping people. You can imagine this started quite a commotion, right? And John quickly earned himself the nickname that he still has today, John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. And what people were doing was they were identifying with John the Baptist saying, you know what? I believe that what John is saying is true and I'm going to go public with the fact that I believe that what John is saying is true, right? Because it's not enough to stand on the riverbank and go, amen, brother, mm-hmm, you got that right, right? That's not enough. No, let's get in the water and let's the, let the people in my community know that I'm aligning myself with John's message. Then one day Jesus shows up where John's baptizing people and he says to John, would you baptize me? And you can imagine John's response, right? He understands who Jesus is and he wants no part in baptizing him. He says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. You should baptize me. In fact, John goes as far as say, I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. And Jesus' response was, no, it's necessary, John. It's necessary that you baptize me. Why? Because here's what Jesus knew. Jesus knew that as people watched, if he allowed John to baptize him, he was identifying with him or affirming or confirming the message of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, the son of God. Then it wasn't long before Jesus' first followers, they began baptizing people, right? So when someone would listen to the message of Jesus and they would in their hearts say, I believe he's the Messiah. I believe that he's come from God. I believe he's the one we've been waiting for, right? Then they would line up and Jesus' disciples, his first followers would baptize them and they would baptize them as a public evidence of the fact that they were lining up with and believing in the message of Jesus. So in a nutshell, that's how baptism gets launched, right? First, there was the Jewish ceremonial cleansing, followed by John the Baptist doing this, his thing in the Jordan River. Then Jesus' first followers began to baptize after that. And then when Jesus left the earth, the last thing he says, right? Okay, you need to get out and tell everybody everything you can remember I've taught. And when they subscribe to our way of thinking, when they decide to become my disciple and my follower, it's not enough that they make a decision on the inside. I want to see evidence of that on the outside. I want you to baptize them, right? And that's how this whole thing happened and we're still doing it 2,000 years later. So let me be clear and wrap this up for us in regard to what it is we believe here at Neighborhood about baptism. See, if you read the New Testament and you follow history, baptism was simply public evidence of something that had happened on the inside. Baptism is a going public event with your faith. Baptism is a public act that pronounces to the world something that God has done for us. When you go into the waters of baptism, it's about us being plunged into the story of Jesus. It's about being dipped into the life of Jesus. We're plunged into Jesus's life by our baptism. It's about what God has done, not what we're qualified to do. And this is really, really important, right? Baptism is the beginning of a journey. This is not something to do after you've reached some pinnacle of spiritual maturity. No, baptism is the starting line, not the finish line. And let me be clear, baptism doesn't save you. Baptism isn't how Jesus starts to do something in your life. Baptism is evidence that Jesus has already begun doing something in your life. Baptism is important because it identifies us with Jesus, but not just with Jesus. 
Baptism also identifies us with the extended spiritual family that we call the church. This is why here at Neighborhood, we have you do a thing that everybody hates. We have people create a video that tells their faith story. And everybody's scared of the video. Nobody likes the video, but the video is a really, really big deal because again, baptism is a going public with your faith, a public expression, right? Yes, baptism is an individual decision, but it's exercised in community. Remember, Christianity is a we faith, not a me faith. And I think one of the most powerful things powerful things we do as a church is baptize people because people have an opportunity to share a piece of their story. So here's the thing. If you need to be baptized, please, 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 please don't let the video drive you off. If you absolutely refuse to do the video, okay, then I want you to know you can go to a different church and be baptized and you can get a group of people together and do your own baptism ceremony if you want, right? That's all fine. We're not going to quibble with you over the form. I don't think that's a great idea, but people do that sometimes here. And I'm like, hey, that's great. You're still in, right? You gathered your friends and family and went to someone's swimming pool and bribed some pastor and honestly, whatever. We're not legalistic about it. But here's the thing. For most of you, when you do your baptism video and are baptized here, you will share your story in those three minutes with more people than you will for the rest of your life. Why would you want to miss that opportunity just because of a little bit of fear? Why would you want to miss out on that chance, that opportunity? Because I sit here on Sunday mornings and I watch the baptism videos. And honestly, as much as I love Jesus and as much as I've studied the scripture, my faith gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger every time I hear one of your stories. Don't rob me. Don't rob the rest of us of knowing and hearing and finding out what God has done in your life because of what it does in our faith and what it does for our church and what it does for people in our family that we call neighborhood church. Listen, on the day that you're baptized, on the day that you share your story, I promise you there will be someone sitting in our audience who needs to hear what you have to say on that on the day that you say it. One of, the, one, of the pushback, listen, one of the pushbacks we get sometimes with the video is, well, Forrest, you know, my story is like everyone else's story. And honestly, that's kind of the point. Thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people around the world, millions of people around the world have basically the same story and they didn't all get in a room and decide what the Christian story should be. It's just the way that God works. And the day that you're baptized, somebody will be in the room and they will need to hear what you have to say the day that you say it. And you may never know their name, but they will never forget your story because God used it at a significant time in their life to help them take a next step of faith, the next step in becoming a follower of Jesus. So we just think it's huge. And I want to invite you to be part of this. If you haven't been baptized, I want you to take the next step. And listen, we get that it can be a little scary, so we're going to help you the whole way through. So if you'd like to be baptized, there's a link that's going to show up on the screen here in just a moment. And I want you to visit that link and start the process, and we'll help you all the way through. Hey, I love you all. I can't wait to see you again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for this morning. And uh, thanks again just for the conversation we're able to have about you and, and what significant, how significant it is for us to be baptized, to stand up and go public with our faith, to identify with you and identify with your family, the church. Jesus, we love you and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Darkness tries to pull over my bones. Fear and sorrow steal joy. I when brokenness and pain is all I know, no, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a
captive to the lies No, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break all every chain. There's power that can empty out the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. Power in your name, there's power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty our grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power. Yeah.